Good morning. Welcome to the 830 Ministry of the Word service at Believer's Chapel. I want to take a moment and read from Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Well, those are wonderful words, and I know we all have moments of fear, and that's a great truth that we can take comfort in. And that's why we're here this morning, uh, to worship the wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, let's begin with a hymn. Looking out, I'm going to go ahead and give the award for the best face covering to Fathom. It almost looks like he's kind of a bank robber. It's really, uh, I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, I don't see Joe here. I want to thank Joe for filling in for me last week. I thought he did a great job. He texted me and said, man, I really messed up. I wore my mask and nobody could understand what I was saying. I said, Joe, that's what made it so good. So thank you, Joe, if you're listening out there. Uh, a few announcements to run through this morning. We have continued to increase the capacity here, so uh, it's great to see so many faces. Please do continue to register online before coming so we can uh, make sure we've got enough room. But as we've mentioned before, with the East Parlor, we've got plenty of seating, and I see uh, plenty of room in here in the auditorium this morning. So if you are home watching and you're concerned that by registering you're maybe taking a spot from somebody else, we've got plenty of room. So we welcome you back when you feel comfortable. Uh, great news, Sunday school will be starting next week. Uh, there will be more information uh, in the bulletin, so I know the teachers are getting their rooms ready and they're excited to have the kids back. The adult class will also uh, be meeting and that will all take place before the Ministry of the Word, so uh, please stay tuned to the online announcements for information on that. And as we do to continue to increase and you do feel uh, Comfortable volunteering in the nursery, please reach out to Sarah Terrell. Uh, one final announcement. Uh, Horace Williams, who many of you uh, know, has gone to be with the Lord. And so please pray for comfort for Wanda and the family. And now Dan will come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Dan. Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It's good to be back with you all. Took a week off. I didn't go anywhere, but was able to watch Jeff preach. Enjoyed that very much. Thank you, Jeff. So it's been, what, two weeks since we were in Second Thessalonians, and you'll remember, hopefully, that uh, we were in an eschatological section of Scripture, and it ended with... Paul speaking of those in the last days and the judgment that will come upon them as unbelievers. Where he says um, in verse 12, in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Really, that's a characteristic of the world at large. And while he's looking at the, uh, the, the, the generation that would come at that future time, it would certainly have characterized so many in Thessalonica when he wrote this letter. And so I think we see a contrast between that and what he says next, where he gives thanks for the Thessalonians who had, in contrast to that, believed. He says, writes in verse 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this 
He called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it this morning. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Lord, it's a great privilege to be together with your people. You uh, instruct us to do that, to not forsake the gathering together of the saints. And uh, we've been forced to do that in these uh, past few months. But it's good that we're beginning to come back together and we're able to meet together in a personal way. And I pray that that will only continue and that you will lift this uh, pandemic and this uh, forced separation upon us and bring us back together and, and give us this opportunity to fellowship together as we're able to do right now, at least with some. And, and uh, thankfully for the technology of the age, we are able to do this virtually over this, uh, the, the airwaves and meet together as, uh, as we do in this uh, virtual way, as I say. But bless us, Lord, uh, this morning as we consider this text in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and build us up in the faith and encourage us. It's a great passage for the age in which we live because we're living in a time, in the immediate time, of uncertainty, at least uncertainty in terms of of uh, humanly speaking, but nothing's uncertain with you, and, and we're reminded of that from this text. You're in complete control. You're in control of, of our lives and our salvation from beginning to end, and that's what Paul encouraged those Thessalonian believers with when they were living in very turbulent, difficult times of, of trial and persecution. And so we're to be comforted by the things we study this morning, and I pray that, um, that we will, and that you will open the eyes of our heart, as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that we might perceive the truth of it and the application of it to our lives. And so, Lord, bless us as we study this morning, and bless us materially as well, physically. We pray for Wanda. Encourage her at this time after the departure of Horus, uh, a man of faith, and we know he's with you, and we take comfort in that, but still, nevertheless, there is a, a sense of, of loss, and as Paul told the Thessalonians in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, we do not grieve as those without hope. We have hope, and she has hope, but we do grieve, and so I pray that you would give her strength at this time. And, and then we pray for those who I have prayed for so often, but we continue to pray for those whose health has been compromised by um, other health issues. I pray for Madeline Hargrove, and I pray for Audrey Harrell and Betty Radford and Margaret Smith, that you would strengthen them and protect them from anything that's in the air, the the viruses out there keep them safe and healthy and their families healthy and, and others who are recovering from this or recovering or dealing with other issues. Some of our members are dealing with protracted problems and I pray that you give them encouragement. I pray that you give them healing. And Lord, we pray for our government. We pray that you give those whom you have appointed over us uh, wisdom as they deal with this pandemic. And we pray that the best things will be done and that we will get through this safely and soon. So bless us. Bless this nation in that way. Bless this as a time when people will reflect on what's really important and on eternal things. And may 
We as your people be a witness and a light in the midst of this time. So Lord, we pray that you would equip us for that, that you would bless us this morning as we consider this text of Scripture in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 through 17, and build us up in the faith, equip us for the, the, the rest of this day and the week to come, that we would be men and women that um, have our confidence in you, live wisely, and may we be lights in this difficult time and to this generation. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The English Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon gave a sermon on our passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. He narrowed it to verses 13 and 14 and titled it simply, Election. He began with the statement, if there were no other text in the sacred word except this one, I think we should all be bound to receive and acknowledge the truthfulness of the great and glorious doctrine of God's ancient choice of his family. Spurgeon thought the doctrine of divine election both true and glorious. And I say amen to that. It is true because it is taught throughout Scripture. It is glorious because it reveals the greatness of God in our salvation. It's all together of the Lord. But also, election is eminently practical. In fact, all doctrine is practical. That's the reason Paul appeals to it throughout this brief book of 2 Thessalonians. It is the basis for the apostle correcting error and giving encouragement and motivation. He did that first in chapter 2 with eschatology. The study of the last things, the final events of history, the study of prophecy. And he wrote about this, first of all, to correct a misunderstanding. The Thessalonians were a confused bunch. They thought they were in the day of the Lord, the final days before the second coming. Confusion is harmful to faith and behavior in the Christian life. So Paul had to correct them. He did it with facts and with logic. The day of the Lord will be known by two events, the apostasy and the coming of Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. Neither had happened, so they weren't in the day of the Lord. But he went into some detail about that day and the character and the career and the end of that future tyrant, not in order to give a lecture on eschatology, or satisfy their curiosity, but to encourage them. In those days, Antichrist will come as the incarnation of unrestrained satanic power that no one can resist. And then suddenly Christ will come and will slay him with just a word, effortlessly. He is the Almighty. The encouragement is Christ, who will slay the Antichrist, was with them, those saints in Thessalonica who were being persecuted by their own Antichrists. But Christ is the Almighty One. He's with them. He would strengthen them through those trials. That's the application they could take away from what He had taught. And so they were to persevere. And they were doing that. Back in chapter 1, he gave thanks for their perseverance and for their increasing faith and love in the midst of tribulation and trials. Clear evidence of their spiritual life and salvation. So Paul now gives them further encouragement based on doctrine. 
In verse 15, he tells them to stand firm. But first he gives the reason that they could do that. And it's due to the Lord's love for them. Paul reminds them of that in verse 13, where he thanked God for their election. Since God so loved them that he chose them for salvation, he will not lose one of them, but bring them all safely home. Now that's how Jesus defined his mission in John chapter 6 and verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, and notice he has given them, the Father has given this great company to his Son, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. He will bring all of his elect ones, his people, home safely. And here in verse 13, Paul gives thanks to the Father that he gave these Thessalonians, whom he loved, whom Paul loved deeply, gave these Thessalonians to the Son. He thanked the Lord for that. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, Beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Paul and his friends felt compelled to give thanks to God for the Thessalonians' election, especially after writing in the previous verse of unbelievers who will be judged for rejecting the truth. Why did these Thessalonians believe the gospel that Paul and the others had preached to them when they came to Thessalonica, Thessalonica and entered the synagogue and gave the gospel? Why did they believe? And why is it that they will escape the judgment to come? Why did they respond to Paul's preaching? It was only because of God's grace. They were his chosen ones. This is one of the, the great mysteries of God's revelation and the Christian life. Not that God chose some and did not choose others. He is God. He can choose whomever He wants and reject whomever He wants. No, the mystery is not election. That God chose some and in fact chose many but that He chose any. Because all of us are equally unworthy of His love and grace and election to eternal life. So, why is there election? Why did God choose anyone? That question was answered by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, when he explained to Israel God's choice of them over the other nations. It wasn't because they were bigger than the other nations. They weren't. They were the fewest of the nations. They weren't the strongest or most advanced. The reason for God's choice of Israel was, as Moses said, because the Lord loved you. Now, why did He love them? No answer is given to that. It's found in His boundless being. Not found in them, not found in Israel, not found in the Thessalonians. It's found in God alone. He loves because He loves. That's His nature. And He loved the Thessalonians. Paul called them beloved by the Lord. That's the reason he chose them. And when was that? From the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of time. Now, that's not specifically defined in our text as before the beginning of time, but that's certainly supported by other passages like Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 where Paul wrote, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. 
applying that to ourselves as believers, His choice of us from before the creation of the world was a choice made before any of us had done anything good or bad. In fact, that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 9 and verse 11 where he explains election. He speaks of the choice of Jacob over Esau. And he said, though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, that's when the choice was made. Before they'd done anything good and bad, God, uh, bad, God had made this distinction. The, and now, now some hear that and they feel that that's not fair, this idea of choosing. So Paul answers that in verse 14 of Romans 9. There is no injustice with God. That's really where we begin. If we want to talk about God, we must talk about one with whom there is no injustice. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. So there's no injustice with God, Paul says. And then he quoted the Lord Himself who said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. It's God's choice and God's will. And God's prerogative. God cannot be unjust. That is against His character, which is holy, just, and good. And it's His creation. He can do what He wants with what is His. But He always does what is right and good. But election is not about justice. If it were, none would be chosen. All would be lost forever because all are guilty. All are equally guilty. But it's not. It's about mercy, which means it is unconditional. It is not based on us. Again, it is based on God. It is rooted in Him and His character and His love. In fact, it must be unconditional since it was from before the creation of the world, before any good or evil had been done. So, again, the mystery is not election. Surely God can choose His family out of His creation. The mystery is not that God has chosen some, but that He has chosen any at all. But that mystery should fill us with awe. And that sense of wonder and gratitude should influence our daily life, especially in times of hardship and discouragement. Since God loved us from eternity and chose us knowing that when we were born into this world, we would be born rebels. Well, since He loved us then, He won't forsake us now that we are His friends his sons, his daughters. And he must have a good purpose for the trials that we have. In fact, Paul indicates the purpose in his statement on sanctification. The salvation God chose us for is through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Now, since God chose people for salvation... You might wonder why he doesn't simply bring us home at the moment of salvation, the moment of faith, regeneration, faith and justification. Just translate us out of this world so that we wouldn't have to suffer the hardships of this life. And the reason that he has not done that is found in that statement about sanctification, which is the lifelong process of changing us from glory to glory, as Paul puts it in 2 Thessalonians, uh, rather 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and verse 18, ma making us fit for heaven, fit for the kingdom to come, fit for the eternal state. The Lord could, could take us out of this world without doing a moment of service for Him without learning to trust Him and obey Him in this world and in the trials and tests of this world. He could take us out 
of this world without experiencing his faithfulness simply from the beginning, without giving us an opportunity to sacrifice for him who sacrificed so much for us and to live a life of grateful service to him. He could have done things differently, but he chose a different way for us. And it is sanctification, transformation of our lives, our character from what we are into being more and more like Christ and doing that in large part through the trials and the tests of life. And in that crucible of the difficulties of life, he, he manifests in us his power and his mercy he manifests that to us, and through that we learn more about him. And in doing that to us, he manifests his grace and his goodness to the world around us. We become a witness to the world. So God puts us, as it were, in the arena, where in the dust of it, in the, the blood and sweat of it, we strive against sin, we imitate the life of Christ, and we come to know Him more personally in that way. And we're given the opportunity to be Christ, as it were, to others and help them. That's God's will for us, to learn and to grow through sanctification. It requires a response. The Christian life is a, a daily struggle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, but not a struggle in our own strength. It is only by the Holy Spirit. The Christian life, as I often say, is a supernatural life. Paul indicates that here. Sanctification, he said, is by the Spirit and faith in the truth. We grow, we're sanctified as we study the Word of God by faith in the truth. But first, it's by the Spirit. In Romans 8, verse 14, Paul defines our, uh, uh, or identifies sons of God as those who are being led by the Spirit. That's a present tense, continually being led by the Spirit. He leads us through this present life. The Holy Spirit is our energizer and guide. He enables us to see what we need to see in the Word of God and, and, and to aspire to it, to desire it. So under His powerful control, we are able to strive up the path to godliness. But it's not a mystical thing. His work within our hearts or minds is done in connection with the Scriptures, the Word of God. What Paul here calls the truth and faith in it. Paul had no doubts about what the Word of God is. It's the truth. It is absolute. It's the foundation for our understanding. We live by faith. That's Paul's description of, of the Christian life in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. But our faith is in something. It's in the Bible. A unique book, a one-of-a-kind book. And I say that because it is, and only it is, divine revelation. And as divine revelation, it tells us everything we need to know about God, the triune God, and man, about ourselves, uh, about our condition, about the remedy, and the course our lives should take, we are to understand it, believe it, and follow it. And as we do, we grow in knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. We, we grow in maturity and spiritual strength. But what Paul indicated here by the order of words is that can only happen by the activity of the Holy Spirit within us. He takes the initiative, just as the Father did in our salvation. And, and all of this goes back to election. God's choice of people to salvation, but salvation through sanctification. 
which means election is to obedience and purity. Election is to holiness. It is to service and goodness. But also and ultimately, election is to glory. That's what Paul says next in verse 14, that it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God has called us to salvation through the lifelong process of, sal of sanctification to a, a life of holiness so that in that way we may gain glory. That, that glorification that's coming really begins at the moment of regeneration and sanctification. Now Paul has moved in his instruction and in his teaching from eternity into time, from the plan of salvation drawn up before the creation of the world to the performance of the plan in the present age with the calling of the elect. This notion of a divine call is very common with Paul, and he often connects it with election and predestination. For example, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 30, he writes, These whom he predestined in eternity past, he also called, meaning in the present. This is not the, the, the general call of the gospel that we give in evangelism. In uh, that case, we are like the... Um, the sower in the parable that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. The sower went out to sow, and he scattered seed, and, and the seed fell on all kinds of ground. Some of it was hard, some of it was rocky, some of it was shallow, and some of it was very good. The seed germinates in some of the ground. It doesn't germinate in others. And likewise, some respond to the gospel, others don't. Now, well, that is giving the call that we give, the general call of the gospel. But this that Paul is speaking of here is not that. This is what theologians call the effectual call given by the Holy Spirit. He works through that call that we give, but his call is effectual. It is ultimately irresistible. And it's connected to God's eternal decree of predestination and election. It cannot fail. It is the Holy Spirit's work in the hearts of hearers, those who hear the gospel, to produce within them a response to that gospel of faith, of belief. Jesus referred to it as being drawn in John chapter 6 and verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We're incapable of coming to him unless the Father works upon us and draws us, and the Father does that through the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, why can no one come unless the Father draws? Because people are naturally opposed to the message of the gospel. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 that the natural man, meaning the unbeliever, the man apart from the grace of God, is hostile toward God, at war with God. That's every one of us apart from God's sovereign grace. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 11, he wrote that there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. None. So it takes a supernatural work of God to bring people to the Lord. It's not forced. It's not coercion. It's persuasion in that when the Spirit causes regeneration or when the Spirit causes the new birth, suddenly a person is equipped. A person has spiritual eyes to see, ears to hear, and realizes the truth and believes. It's the natural result of the supernatural work of being born again. But again, just as with sanctification, 
the Holy Spirit works in connection with the Scriptures in sanctification, so too His work of calling people to Christ is in connection with Scripture, the giving of the Gospel. And Paul was reminding them of that moment when he and his friends came to Thessalonica. They came to the synagogue, they, they preached the gospel, and they, these Thessalonians, believed. He called you through our gospel, Paul says. That was the reason he could confidently give thanks to God for his choice of them in election. They believed. That's the sign of election. The fundamental sign of election is faith. The elect believe, the non-elect don't. And having believed, Paul could give them the assurance of glory to come. That's what they were chosen for. That's what they were called to. That they may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So... This brings us full circle from election in eternity past to the glory we will have for all eternity in the future. It is the glory of Christ. Think about that for a moment. The glory of Christ. What must that be like? That's what you as a believer have been called to. The glory of Christ. I say, what must that be like? I will say this, it's beyond us. You can think all you want. You'll never begin to scratch the surface of what that is like. But we have some idea of it from the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, when the Lord's face shone like the sun. But also in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, we're given, I, th I think, a hint of uh, what is meant here when the Apostle John fell at the feet of an angel and worshipped him. And that angel told him, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours. Worship God. But if an angel is so glorious that John felt compelled to fall down and worship it, how much more glorious is Christ? His glory is infinite. And that is what we have, by God's grace, been called to. Righteousness and glory. That's what God chose His family to in eternity and what He calls them to in time and what He is now preparing them for by trials and hardships an eternal weight of glory, according to 2 Corinthians 4.17. Beyond all comparison, Paul says, that eternal weight of glory is. Now that's worth the challenges of life that we go through. So as these Thessalonians went through their persecutions and afflictions, Paul urges them to stand firm and hold on to the traditions and all that he has just said in this chapter encouraged them to do that. The Lord is in control. Christ is almighty and can deter and defeat any antichrist that they will face and that they were facing and make them, make these Thessalonians triumph over every situation. And God so loves them that he chose them from the beginning, to be saved and glorified. The end, therefore, is certain. They had this certain conviction. They should have had it, as we should have it. Therefore, their, their present trials would not be allowed to crush them, but only used by the Lord ultimately to sanctify them. And He would bring them safely through it all, bring them to their heavenly rest and glory. That's the assurance God's love and election give to every believer. So be encouraged, he was saying, and stand firm. That's the goal of doctrine. It is to sanctify us. 
It is to change our thinking and resolve to strengthen us so that we will not be shaken by the trials of life and drawn away by the material pleasures of the world before he gives a, 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 a an imperative, he always gives an indicative. Before he gives a command, he always bases it on fact, on who God is and what he's done. And here he speaks of the traditions that he urges them to hold to in standing fast. That's not extra biblical traditions of men, such as those that the Pharisees and the scribes held to, but what Paul is referring to here is the instruction the apostles gave verbally or by letter, instruction that had not yet been codified in the New Testament. But what he's saying, to put it in another way or simplified, is hold to the Word of God. Hold to the revelation that's been given by the prophets of old or given by the apostles. Hold to God's Word because it is through Scripture, through God's revelation, that we are sanctified, that we are conformed to Christ, that we are made mature and wise and strong so that we can stand firm. It must be grounded in the revelation of God and the Word of God. But Paul had more to offer the Thessalonians than encouragement. He also had prayer, which is as important as doctrine, the doctrine rather that he has recounted, to give confidence, to stand firm, to persevere. He prayed for that. Through prayer, we go to the source of our strength. We learn about it in the Word of God, and the Spirit of God, as we learn about these things, through His Word, uses that to actually bring about real, actual change within us. Just as we take in nourishment with the food we eat and it strengthens us physically, it's transformed into energy and what all it's transformed into, so too the Word of God is transformed into energy and life-changing work within us. And so we, we are changed through the study of the Word of God, but through prayer we go directly to the source of all of this. And we make our requests known to God, and He hears us, and He answers us. Prayer is effective. So in verses 16 and 17, Paul prayed for them. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. So, you see, divine election doesn't preclude prayer any more than it prevents evangelism. Both are the means that God uses to accomplish His ordained will. So pray earnestly and tell the lost of Christ. These are, those are His means of bringing about His will. What is notable about this prayer, almost as a parenthesis in, in what Paul is saying or what I've been teaching, almost as a, a kind of parenthesis, is what Leon Morris calls the, or refers to as the place it, as this prayer assigns to Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've noticed that. He is linked closely with the Father, and he's even given the first position. Now that's unusual, but it shows the equality of the two. This is Trinitarian. Christ in his incarnation was subject to the Father. When he became a man, he became a creature. Didn't lose his deity, but in his creatureliness, he was obedient to the Father, as we must be obedient. But in his divine nature, as the Logos, as the eternal second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, he is equal with the Father. They are one, as Jesus said. Now, that is a mystery, the mystery of the Trinity, that there can be three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but one God. We can't really explain it fully, 
But we can rest in the fact that that's what Scripture teaches. We see it here in the the placement of the two names and the order that's given there, but also in the, the, the grammar here. The singular who and the singular love. It's really, if I can get a little technical, a singular participle. And not not plural. Speaking of two persons in the singular, which refers to the Godhead in unity. It shows that, in the practical sense, as it applies to us, it shows that the Godhead, the three in one, are for us and love us. No greater love was demonstrated than the sacrifice of Christ. The Father giving up His Son and the Son willingly dying for His people. Since God gave the greatest gift He could give for our salvation, and He did so when we were His enemies, when we were estranged from Him, what will He withhold from us for our good? Well, nothing, not at all. Not the comfort and the strength that Paul prays for here and the need, what we need, I should say, for doing what he then speaks of as the good work and word that we both do and give. He won't withhold that strength. If, if he would not withhold his own son from us when he offered him up as the sacrifice for us, when we were his enemies, now that we're his children, his sons and his daughters, His family, he's certainly not going to deny us the best that we need. The strength to be faithful in hard times or even in, in good times is not within us. We don't have that strength. That's why I say that the Christian life is a supernatural life. It's not in us naturally. It is found only in the Lord. That's the reason that Paul prays for it and and why we must pray for those things. Pray for it daily. But where did Paul get the confidence to pray for this? Or where did we get the audacity, as it were, to go to the creator of the universe, the one who holds it all within his hand, or if we could even put it this way, who holds within the tip of his hand, cosmic finger, the whole vast universe. Where do we get the audacity to go to Him and ask for anything? We're weak creatures creatures coming to the Almighty God. Where do we get that kind of confidence? That confidence comes from His revelation here that He made an ancient choice of us to be His sons and daughters, to be His family. That gives us the right to come to Him. At any time, and always come to him. Now, to speak of that is not is not bragging, because again, a correct understanding of election recognizes it's all of grace. His choice of one over another, of Jacob over Esau, has nothing to do with personal merit. It has to do with God's mercy. Understanding that. And believing it gives us the ground for confidence in in prayer to go to the Lord God and seek what we need. It gives us the confidence to live a life of boldness. It affects our behavior. It, It gives us confidence in our deeds and in our words. Sovereign grace is a great and glorious blessing and practical. The Scot and minister Samuel Rutherford understood that. He was instrumental in writing the Westminster Confession of Faith and its shorter catechism with its famous question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Rutherford did that through afflictions. He was put in jail for his faith. His first wife died. He remarried. His second wife died. 
In the course of his life, seven of his children preceded him in death. All of that, even a fraction of that, is enough tragedy to crush a man. But he used to say, Whenever I find myself in the cellar of affliction, I always look about for the wine. Oh, God's sovereign love for His people is wine. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's because God in His infinite and unconditional love made the ancient choice of you to be in His family forever. And since He chose us from eternity before we had done anything good, knowing we would be born rebels, He will not forsake us now that we are His friends, now that we are His sons, now that we are His daughters. He will bring us safely home. So the doctrine of divine election should make the Christian bold in his or her faith. God is for us. Who can be against us? We are God's chosen ones, loved by God Almighty. Yet, saints sometimes doubt that and wonder if they are really the, the chosen ones and they lack that uh, comfort that Paul prayed for. That's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for Christians to experience that because the devil loves to sow doubt in our hearts. Doubt's crippling, and he sows it. The way out of that to confidence and possessing the good hope that Paul speaks of here, the hope that the Lord gives us, is through prayer and the Word of God, reading the Bible. In it, God speaks to our heart. It is living and active, and it has a genuine effect upon us. As I often quote, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. As you do that, God will enable you to see it, see your relationship with Him, confirm it, see the, the great blessing of it and have the assurance you need and have a full understanding of this very doctrine that we've been studying and that troubles people so often. Study the Word. Pray. God blesses that. Still, the fact is that uh, this doctrine of election does trouble people. It's hard, they say. Spurgeon knew that very well. So midway through his sermon on election, he asked the congregation if anyone wanted it. Did they want to be elect? And did they want to have all that election is to? Election is to a life of holiness, a, a new life in God's family as God's children. If you want that, he said, then God has elected you. But if you don't want that, if you want the world instead and your pleasures, your way, not God's way, then what right do you have to say God ought to have given you what you do not wish for? Supposing, he said, <clears throat> I had in my hand something which you do not value. And I said, I shall give it to such and such a person. You have no right to grumble that I didn't give it to you. You could not be so foolish as to grumble that the other has got what you do not care about. According to your own confession, many of you do not want a new heart and a right spirit, do not want forgiveness of sins, do not want sanctification. You do not want to be elected to these things. You count these things but as husks. And why should you complain of God who has given them to those whom He has chosen. No, oh, that's fair. You can't complain about fairness when, <clears throat> when you're not given the very thing you don't want, the very thing you have rejected. But for those who want it, it's for them. They've been chosen by God. So, what about you? Do you want the forgiveness of sins? 
Do you want a new life, a clean life, a life with good hope of eternity in God's house and in the new heavens and the new earth? Then do what all the elect do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for sins for you. The moment you do, you're saved and have the very thing God's election is to, eternal life and glory. Now, that's how you know you are one of the chosen ones. Believe. Nothing could be more fair. If you haven't believed, may God help you to do that. And you who have, understand a little more further the great and glorious love that God has for you and will always have for you. Let's give thanks as we close in prayer for that electing love and then prepare our hearts for our taking of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for this great text of Scripture that re recalls Your greatness, Your love for the lost. Not just the lost, but those who were in rebellion against You and yet You chose some not a few, but multitudes to be your family. And you sent your son to die for them and obtain their salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. It's all of you. We give you all the glory. And we thank you for the blessings that we have in Christ. And now, Lord, as we come to the Lord's Supper, we pray that you'd prepare our hearts for it, that you would... Give us a sense of the great sacrifice that your Son has made for us. And in doing that, we pray that you would give us gratitude and thankful hearts. Thank you for him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Thanks, Dan. That was a wonderful message. Praise the Lord. We're here this morning to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross for us. When Christ came to earth, he came to a dark and sinful world, populated by sinners as, as us, you and me. We could not remedy our own situation. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. That was the world. And then quoted from the same verse. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, of which he loved us, planned from all eternity to redeem and rescue sinners by sending his son, the Lamb of God, who took away the sins of the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 4 that I came to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I think we all know what he came to accomplish, but... In Matthew chapter 1, it's very nicely described when the angel spoke to, to Joseph and said, she will bear a son, that's Mary, his wife. She will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. At the very end of Christ's life on earth, he said, hanging on the cross, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Three days later, he was resurrected as a proof that the sacrifice was effectual. The work he came to accomplish, the work of our redemption, was finished on the cross. There's nothing we can add. Nothing, nothing, nothing. The work of the retribution is not done yet. That will be done by the seven angels with the seven Bowls of wrath, as we can read about in the book of Revelation. That judgment is necessary.
because God is righteous. But it has nothing to do with us at all. It's not for his elect, by his grace. And I think we all, in our hearts, look forward to the day when he will come back for us and we will be with him forever. So we have to remember what he did. Before I give thanks for the bread, I would read chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim Lord's death until he comes back. If you're one of his, and that you believe that Christ died for your sins, then we invite you to partake of the Lord's Supper, of the elements, whether you're at home or if you're here. If you're here. I'd like to give thanks for the, for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come before you with thankfulness for the love and grace that you have given to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him and the, that he willingly, as the unblemished Lamb of God, was crucified for our transgressions. We thank you for the eternal comfort and hope we have given through your grace. And we ask that you give us a strong faith that we will always remember this and trust you whatever circumstances in life you are putting us in. We were blind, but by your grace we see. We thank you for that. Help us to live a life of obedience and love, and that we'll be able to stand up to the world and proclaim the truth until you return. We praise your Father, and we thank you for your Son and the sacrifice. We now pray that we'll be able to take this bread in a worthy manner to your glory. Amen. <clears throat> Stan made reference to John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, so I'm just going to read that uh, passage and then make a few comments on it. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This passage makes it clear who it was on the cross that day. It was the God-man. He was thirsty and asked for drink. That indicates his humanity. But he did that in order, as the text says, to fulfill Scripture. He was in complete control of all of these events. That reveals his deity. He controlled even his death itself. When he drank the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It's been observed, and I remember oftentimes Dr. Johnson would make this observation, that when people die normally, they give up their spirit, then their head bows. But Christ bowed his head, then gave up his spirit. He did that when, when he had fulfilled all prophecies. That was when he willed his death to complete his mission and accomplish atonement. It is finished, he said. That is not a statement of defeat. That is a statement of triumph. The work of salvation is done. There's nothing more to be done. Your sin has been punished. Your debt fully paid. All you can do is simply receive as a free gift that atoning work of Christ, that work on the cross, that forgiveness. 
Receive it by faith. If you've done that, you're saved. You are forgiven and you have eternal life. And we're here to remember that with this bread and the wine, which speaks of who He is and what He's done. And that should put within us, as we reflect upon it, that He's done it all, and the work is finished, hearts full of gratitude. Let's give thanks for the wine. Father, we do thank You for this cup that speaks of the violent sacrifice that Your Son underwent in our place. He wasn't taken against His will like the, the, the bull or the ox or the lamb that was taken to the slaughter in the Old Testament. He went willingly. In fact, all of the events were under the control of our triune God, under your control, under Christ's control. He went willingly to die for us and made the great sacrifice that has atoned for our sins and has obtained our salvation and not only that, but given us the great privilege of being sons of God with a glorious inheritance. Thank you for that. We thank you for this cup. We thank you for our Savior, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, that brings our service this morning to a conclusion. I enjoyed being with you and face to face and look forward to seeing you next week. Let's close a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We have considered your great love for us, the great sacrifice that you offered up to obtain us for yourself, to secure the choice that you made. You have elected your people from the foundation of the world from before time. And as the scriptures make very clear, it's not a small group. It's an innumerable multitude, a vast number. And the blood of Christ is sufficient to pay for it all, and an infinite number for that matter. We thank you for that. It's a sacrifice that he made that completed the whole work of salvation. It's finished, he said. And we're absolutely secure in him. Help us to understand that. And that he will hold us fast and never let us go. Thank you for that. We thank you for him. We thank you for our triune God and the love that you have for us and that will see us through to the very end. Give us strength in the meantime. Help us to stand firm, we pray. And we pray these things in Christ's name. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Until next week, keep looking to Christ.